Jennifer Hostler. 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 Um, from the Washington City Church of the Brethren, which many of you may be familiar with. It's not far from here. And also this is where, the, it's the church where Code Pink and Raging Grannies were just a couple of months ago. Um, and Reverend Jen has been uh, involved in, I met her through one of the actions with Christians for Free Palestine and also we were both at some things with Christian or DC for Ceasefire and then are also involved with Christians for Ceasefire in DC. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to thank you for being here to talk about Christian Zionism. Hear your experiences growing up and just give us some more insight into this kind of scary um, force that is so powerful at this time. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with you and just thank you for all of you for being here and your ongoing witness every day of, for Palestine, for Gaza, for justice. So, thanks. Um, I thought I would start by just talking a little bit about Christian Zionism and some forms of Christian Zionism, and then also just share a little bit about my own experience in Christian Zionism and coming out of that, because I thought that can be a little illustrative. Um, and so what types of Christianity support Christian Zionism? You may know this, but it's often evangelicals or fundamental, fundamentalist Christians, um, sometimes more charismatic Christians that also share some evangelicalism. But sometimes you can find some general Christian Zionism or Christian Zionism light, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, even within some mainline churches and with some Catholics, though there's obviously some folks who might not support that. With Jim Jones? Christian Jim Jones um, from the cult? I am not sure. So, but good question. So let's save questions. Yeah. Right. Questions, please, to that list. Okay. And so, and as you may also know, there are uh, many predominantly white Christian churches, evangelical churches that are Christian Zionist. But there are, as um, Reverend Dr. Munthri Sak mentioned on Monday, and Medea was there, um, there are really growing Zionists, Christian Zionists within Latin America and also in, in Africa as well. So it's, it's very much a white Christian thing, but it's not just a white Christian thing, unfortunately. Um, so as I see it, there's some sort of two forms, or maybe even two plus forms of Christian Zionism. There's kind of Christian Zionism light um, that is can still lead to, you know, support for oppression. So it's still not great. Um, but this, in a nutshell, is Israel is in the Bible. I see Israel, therefore let's support Israel. I'm a Christian, I believe the Bible, let's support Israel. And so it's the belief that Christians are called to support the present nation state of Israel, and it's just de facto given that that is a home for Jews. Um, and some of the theological understanding is that God blessed Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham. Therefore, and it talks about, well, bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you in Genesis. And that um, God also seeks to bless Jews in Israel and anyone who curses Israel will be cursed. So you've seen, I believe, one of the Congress people who was talking with the president of Columbia University cited some of that exact language. Um, it's really, that's really one of the, one of the verses that people go to. Um, but often, and typically, there is no comprehensive biblical theology uh, that examines sort of the whole Bible and what the whole Bible says about Israel. Like it fails to talk about the Hebrew prophets. Um, so Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, um, Hosea, so many prophets that pronounced judgment on Israel, on Judah and Samaria. So this is someone who, people who were Hebrews who were Jewish who pronounced judgment. Um, and it, so it, they're not doing a full like examination of like, does this verse in Genesis really play out through the thread of our theology? And then for specifically for Christians, um, how does this relate to what Jesus said? And in terms of words about justice. So it's, it's really just um, focusing on, on Israel. Okay, Israel it says support Israel. I'm not gonna question it. That's what it is. Um, and then in terms of uh, Christian Zionist light, sort of their understanding and relationships to Jews, um, they often would hold the belief that, you know, that anti-Semitism in theory is, is bad, that is that the Holocaust was bad, and therefore also that Jews deserve their own state, kind of just like logical sequence. Um, they may or may not 
know Jews necessarily, um, but they might have um, some of that sort of background. Um, and some of the literature on Christian Zionism really talks about um, sort of an understanding, kind of a kind of a really pat understanding of Jews, sort of like, well, use you and like you're good in theory, but when it really comes to engaging interpersonally, it might not. Um, or within some of the other Jewish values that you know U.S. Jews are, might have on some other progressive issues, there's not necessarily um, on the same page. So, um, and with Christian Zionism light, overall, um, people don't typically have knowledge of Palestinian Christians. They don't usually have knowledge of the Nakba, what happened in 1948 or before or after really anything about the occupation in Israel. They might understand that there's a quote unquote conflict, um, but that might be perceived by people as Muslim Jewish and therefore they're on the side of the Jews because unfortunately there's often stereotypes and prejudice against Muslims. Um, or they might just hear things and see it framed as terrorism by Muslims. And again, that plays into some of the other narratives that are we have going on in the US and around the world, unfortunately, for Muslim communities. So that's kind of Christian Zionism light that might not necessarily have this sort of apocalyptic end of the world piece to it. And I think that's really helpful. Uh, as I was processing, I think that's helpful for me to understand that not everyone is really doing the, like backing Israel to sort of trigger this end of the world end times. Um, but some people do have that in mind. And Cole passed out some great resources here um, from Christians for Free Palestine. But so there's this apocalyptic Christian Zionism that's part of a specific branch of Christianity that um, is, again, is evangelical and fundamentalist, but it really only came about within the past 150 years. Um, it's really new of their understanding of their end times, of when Jesus is gonna come back, of this thing called the rapture. Um, and I'll get into more of that um, So in a second. Um, so again, this apocalyptic Christian Zionism, they believe that Christians are called to support the present nation state of Israel, home for Jews, um, believe similar things about um, God blessing Abraham, of wanting to bless Israel, we need to bless Israel. Um, and this really, even this, I didn't quite mention it, but this transactional, and as, in some threads, you'll see a lot of Christian nationalism as well. Like we believe the USA is blessed by God. We want to be blessed by God further. We will bless Israel because those who bless Israel are blessed by God. And so this kind of transaction that this country's blessings um, are connected to Israel's blessings and blessing Israel is kind of this reciprocal. Um, and again, we don't criticize Israel because we support Israel because God had blessed it. So this thing called the rapture um, apologies for getting into this, these obscure, um, but obviously that's what you asked me to do. Obscure little Christian beliefs um, that are held by a lot of people in the United States. So um, there's this something called dispensationalism, which is just sort of an understanding. It's like most Christians believe in sort of a second coming of Jesus, um, that Jesus um, came, did his ministry on earth, um, died, rose again, appeared to his disciples, and was ascended into heaven, and then um, the church is involved of continuing the work of Jesus, ministering, um, but that someday Jesus will come and sort of fulfill, um, fulfill the rest of God's kingdom. Like we will experience a new heaven, a new earth, um, restored. I mean, there's different things that Christians emphasize, but basically healing everything in, in the good sense is that the final, the final finality will come. Um, but so a certain type of end times belief really talks about this thing called the rapture that is God taking away everyone who is a true believer in Jesus. Just disappear, you may have heard of the Left Behind series of books. Um, I read those as a middle schooler. Um, that's a fictionalized account um, of that. Um, and it's in that they think that, so Jesus will take away all of the, the true believers and then um, everyone who is left are Jews and all who are not Christian and not Jewish. And the belief is that Jews will en masse come to Jesus and or, or perish in like a tribulation period. And also that everyone else will have opportunity to come to Jesus or perish in this tribulation period. And then um, at a certain point of time, Jesus will come back and sort of like final judgment, everything's done. Um, and that 
as part of that, a regathering of the Jewish diaspora in Israel is, is sort of this key factor for all of that happening. Um, it's essential to the, both the rapture and the second coming of Jesus and Jewish control of the land, the ancient land of Israel, like is, is crucial in this view, especially Jerusalem where the site of the former temple was. We know it as Al-Aqsa. Muslims know it as a noble sanctuary. Jews understand it as a temple mount. And many people in this view understand that there needs to be a new temple on there, which obviously that means that Al-Aqsa Mosque would not be there. Um, so um, that would be problematic, <laughs> as we all know. Um, <clears throat> let me see my notes. Um, Again, um, with these types of Christian Zionists, many people don't have interpersonal relationships with Jews, um, and the well-being of Israel is sort of a stepping stone to their own redemption. Um, and sometimes folks in this might say things that are really anti-Semitic, um, even though they say they love Jews and love Israel. Um, and again, there's probably not a knowledge of Palestinian Christians, of the Nakba, or anything about the occupation. They might understand that there's a conflict um, and again think of it as a Muslim Jewish thing um, and overlaying that are some folks who are really pro-war who really want to do whatever it takes for Israel to get the land they need um, since it's prophesied and then there's a lot of overlap with Christian Zionism so yeah so I was born and raised in Canada I was originally baptized Roman Catholic but we weren't really practicing um, other than I attended a, a religious school um, and then my mom started going to a Baptist church in Canada. There are only two types of Baptists in Canada versus a lot of a lot of types of Baptists here. Where I was going was probably a little closer to Southern Baptist, but not not anywhere near as conservative or as political. Um, so I didn't really think about Israel. My church didn't really talk about Israel much. Um, I knew that Israel was a country and Israel was in the Old Testament, but I don't think I equated them per se. But I also didn't make a distinction between them. Um, and then the Left Behind series came out and this Christian Zionist fiction that I mentioned that was a bestseller in the 90s and 2000s. There are 16 books, which is a lot of books. Um, talks about the desert blooming and the great transformations that Israelis made in the desert in this book. Um, and that modern day Jews end up having control over the entire breadth of Israel, that there's the rapture, the Jews are there and everyone else. And then also that there's this big sort of Armageddon with Russia and with other people and an antichrist, um, which again is what people believe, um, <clears throat> but this was fictionalized. Um, when I was in high school, my mom remarried and her um, her husband at the time had sort of a, I don't, um, a really interest and love for Israel. And so he sort of curated this, um, these items like IDF, like water bottle and a belt and other things. And he had a kippah on display and so, didn't really unpack that it was just sort of like what he did like he kind of went through phases and he really liked Israel but it was also kind of assumed that like oh we're Christian yes Jews Israel they go together um, in in terms of um, going from there I attended undergraduate at Moody Bible Institute which is a school in Chicago <laughs> you know it <laughs> okay um, <clears throat> And one of the left behind authors was on the, is on the board or was on the board of Moody Bible Institute, Jerry Jenkins. Um, and it's a dispensationalist school, so it taught about the rapture. That's something in their core beliefs of the end times. Um, they believe Jews had a, still had a special covenant with God along with Christians um, and that someday they would all follow Jesus or um, face judgment. Um, we, there were several Messianic Jewish professors, and I know that that's a polemical term, but that's how they self-identified as, as Messianic Jewish, um, and that included someone who was a child of Holocaust survivors whose parents were not Christian, just identified as Jews. Um, but late in, throughout the school, there wasn't necessarily a lot of talk about Israel, but it was um, late in just this um, unconditional support of Israel. Um, and I realized that a little later on during my undergraduate degree. So um, for my own like personal development, I started reading a lot of global news. Um, and um, <clears throat> in 2005, I saw, while I was in college, I saw the withdrawal of um, Israeli settlements from Gaza and that pullout. Um, and I saw like settlers being like 
pulled away, literally pulled away and dragged away. Um, didn't fully understand, but I saw that some things were going on. Um, I also started becoming friends with students who grew up in um, Arab countries, from in the UAE, um, in Syria, and in Jordan. And um, these Syrian and Jordanian Christians like exposed me to Arab Christians. Um, and there was this, my friend from the UAE, who grew up in the UAE said, I can't believe that we're talking about Israel this way and no one ever talks about the Nakba. And I'm sure I was something like the Wetba, like I have no idea what this is. <laughs> and just like, it was a little like, stick in the gears of like, oh, there's something that I don't fully know and understand here. Um, and then while I was still in college, the 2006 Lebanon war happened. Um, war against Lebanon, um, Israel and Lebanon. Um, and there was in this um, student who was a citizen of Israel, Jewish, identified as a Messianic Jew. And I remember talking with him. We are like, oh, wow, this is happening. And he said, yeah, I'm going back to fight in Israel. And he was training for Christian ministry. And I was just... Um, confused and a little and disturbed and he started realizing that there was this vocal support for Israel without question uh, and that there was this equating of the present nation state of Israel with um, what is in the Bible and people none of the professors were willing to really criticize Israel and I was seeing what was happening in Lebanon there were things that seemed like they were human rights abuses seemed like inappropriate levels of violence um, and why would a Christian go and be part of that? Um, and I hadn't come on board yet for to be with my belief in Christian nonviolence, Christian peacemaking, or pacifism. Um, but I was studying the Bible, trying to do biblical theology, and, and trying to read what the Bible says about justice um, for the vulnerable, for the oppressed, both in what Christians call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh, um, and in the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> and I really became seeing reading the Bible is what made me, and being exposed to people who really saw Jesus' message of peace um, made me committed to Christian peacemaking and active nonviolence. I also, at that time, as I was in that journey, um, I visited a church where what used to be called Christian peacemaker teams, now community peacemaker teams, um, people who do accompaniment in the West Bank, um, they were presenting and they talked about, they talked about Palestine and I remember saying to the person who's my now partner, this was, it wasn't as far on the journey as I am now and I was like wait Palestine isn't a country is it and so just that like that ignorance of not knowing um, not understanding not being exposed is I think something that a lot of a lot of Christians have um, but so then I became more exposed to Christian peacemaker teams including someone named Art Gish who like stood in front of bulldozers in Hebron and um, unlike Rachel Corey survived um, and really people who had dedicated their lives to peacemaking and to really putting their own bodies on the line to do so and started learning about the occupation, the Gaza war, and really all of the cracks in this sort of like happy, oh, Israel, Israel, everything is good. Like we support Israel. I realized supporting Israel meant that supporting the present nation state of Israel couldn't be, uh, is it wasn't congruent with what the values I saw of Jesus teaching me. Um, and so all that crumbled down and I really learned about the movement for um, justice for Palestinians um, and the history, um, great history of, of nonviolent movements, um, and especially in parts of like the first intifada and in other um, aspects of the movement for liberation. Um, and so it was a slow evolution. Um, and then also eventually my spouse became on the board for Churches for Middle East Peace and on for Christian Peacemaker Teams, Community Peacemaker Teams. He traveled, so I just kept getting more and more exposure. Um, and uh, eventually, I mean, and so I became committed to um, at least advocating, you know, through hill visits or other things, not hill visits, but letters to my um, representatives and senators when I had some, when I wasn't just in DC. And then um, set the basement for basis for um, wanting for justice in Palestine, and then that sort of set a foundation for really pivoting um, in, from since October of, of activism and organizing for for free Palestine and for an end to the genocide. So.
So we have a handout here um, that's um, some of the teachings from Christians from a free Palestine that talks about, about Christian Zionism, that's this belief that establishing the state of Israel um, as a Jewish state will bring about Jesus' second coming, the end of the world, when Christians will reach salvation, and non-Christians um, will be given an opportunity to choose Jesus, um, but if not, they will face judgment um, and, uh, and destruction. Um, and so some of the organizations that really back Christian Zionism, one is Christians United for Israel, or KUFI, and that's led by John Hagee, uh, Texas megachurch pastor, and um, their notes here say that the most, the, he's the most powerful anti-Semite in America, um, but he speaks at different, um, I think he spoke at the March for Israel, and um, so raises money, Kufi raises money to fund illegal settlements, legally a church, so they, so they don't have to share how much they give to elected officials. And so um, underlying Christian Zionism are this, these um, beliefs that white Christians should control the government and beliefs that they have about Israel and about Israel's relationship to Christianity and the end times should, you know, be supported, should, should work themselves out through government policies that also support Israel. Um, and so people also don't want to, sometimes they want to defund UNRWA, move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, as we saw under, under Donald Trump. Um, yeah, I can, I don't want to go through all of it necessarily, but I can. I mean, to me, one of the really um, kind of disturbing things about this, like you shared your story, and there were all these points where in, new information kind of created that cognitive dissonance for you, and then you did some research and just learned more about it until you realized that there was more to the story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was surprised to learn that Kufi is relatively new, like 2006. And just you know, now they have over 10 million followers, and and they really have a lot of um, like influence on our political system through like daily and weekly messages to um, their members, um, and through John, Pastor John Hagee's um, sermons through his megachurch, and um, those are also online, so they reach many many people. And he, you know, does a lot of fundraising through that. Um, and so all of those points where you might have, when you had the, those little glimmers of, oh, what, what's happening, or why am I not quite understanding this whole picture? Like, there's a very strong propaganda um, system trying to keep people from doing that. On top of all of the other stuff that we, you know, the, the media coverage and all of that, you know. So if some, if a Christian has those, like you call Christian light, or Christian Zionism light beliefs, like you could see how all of these layers, including our own kind of indoctrination through our American education system that whitewashes our own history of colonial, um, uh, what is it? Colonial settler, settler colonialism. Settler colonialism. Yes. Yeah, um, so I don't know. Like I just I'm not sure. I'm not really sure what the answer is, but it's I think it's good to know like the powers that we're that we're kind of up against. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, people are are getting things from their congregation, if they're talking about it, they might not be talking about sort of like global issues in general, but might touch on Israel because Israel is in the Bible, or might um, have different schooling arrangements that don't have a broader education or media, and even just like meeting people who are different from them. Yeah, like, and the book bands that we're hearing, like all of it is kind of, kind of related to um, don't learn what is happening and also then the um, the political influence they have through like the Kufi summit of bringing people from around the country here and and then sending them into the, the lobbyist offices or there there is also the Kufi action fund that does some like political ads that attack some people um, and um, yeah I don't know one more thing is um, from what Winthrop Slack said on Monday. I was just when working with evangelicals, um, 
one of the biggest, most powerful things is just introducing them to a Palestinian Christian. So in the conversation, okay, so what about, and, and Munter's like really stressed, he's like, we care about everyone, we want everyone to be caring about everyone in Palestine, but for some Christians, that's the thing that will jar them a little bit out of, out of this unfettered um, support for Israel is just that, um, what about Palestinian Christians who are facing oppression because of this? And that can give people some pause and they don't necessarily have an answer for it. So few people know how many uh, Palestinian Christians there are and that they're actually an endangered minority in uh, Palestine, largely due to what Israel has historically been doing. Sorry, it's an endangered minority. And I brought that up to the priest at our church, Nativity. It's like the archdiocese to do something because the humanitarian crisis, but also there are, if that's all you're worried about, there are endangered Christians in the Catholic sphere as well. So you should care about everyone. They're an endangered minority, and a lot of the Christian churches and Catholic churches have been involved. Yeah, and in the past 20 years, the amount of emigration, even just since October 7th, the amount of emigration out of the West Bank into other places, it just life is so hard because they clamp down on on all movement, no one can work outside in Israel like they used to, and no tourists, um, life is really, really hard, and so if people have any way out, they um, make, it's a choice, and then also the issue of Israel doesn't allow family reunification, um, so if you're Palestinian and you marry someone from Europe or from here, I know someone who's been working for like almost, as, for like 30 years to try to get permanent residency, um, so could you talk a little bit about like how this would affect Congress and the way Congress works? Is it more Republican than Democrat? This money, how do we have any sense of money that goes to elected officials? Yeah, um, so I would say um, there are both Republican and Democrats who are Christian Zionists. Um, some Christian Zionists light, some Christian Zionists more the apocalyptic kind. Um, and that really taints how they think about their foreign policy. And I think, and then we have money both from APEC, obviously, and the money from KUFI coming in, and we don't um, don't know how much money is, in, is is influencing folks. And so I'm not as familiar with the, the money of um, KUFI in politics, but I think it's really problematic that both they have this theological and financial um, these theological financial influences, and so what can voters, you know, the majority of Americans want an end to the violence in Gaza, to the genocide in Gaza. Not everyone obviously would call it a genocide, um, but if this, if these financial and, and theological influences are, are saying that you should just keep sending Israel bombs, um, then that's, they're not going to vote to stop things. They're not going to vote, they're going to invite Netanyahu to come and talk to Congress. I was wondering if you have a sense of the rhetorical justification for some of the Christian Zionist beliefs that are comfortable with harm waged against the Palestinian people. Like, how, how do they frame, or what's the theological understanding, rhetorical justification for murder, like sin, things that go against the Ten Commandments? Something like, I mean, I'm reading, funding illegal... Israel settlements. I can understand where, like, if your belief is that Jews have to return to Israel, that's why you would pursue that. But how is that explained, or what's some of the rationale behind all of the harm that is then done because of that? Framing that with Christian values. Yeah, unfortunately, since like the year around, like, in the 300s, um, when Constantine Emperor like converted to Christianity that's when sort of this like just war theory um, this Christian Christians in power Christians with might with military really took off and um, that legacy continues today with a lot of Christians interpreting um, some of the violence uh, in the Bible um, particularly the the battles, you know, for the um, the land of Israel and some of the, the Hebrew scriptures um, 
as justifying that violence is okay, like that war is okay. I mean, there's a lot that Jesus says and some things that Paul says and some of the letters in the New Testament that are really against that. Um, like love your enemies. Um, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Um, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, do good to those who are doing harm to you. I mean, it's, um, but people just feel like, oh, well, maybe Jesus didn't really say that or they ignore that. And, um, and this notion that revenge is right when though there are scriptural um edicts against revenge um yeah it's 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 selective interpretation and also some of it is the dehumanization of um well if they did violence i mean obviously this is talking about things in a vacuum but if we're just if someone is just looking at october 7th and they're saying oh well hamas did violence to israel they can hit them as they want Failing to, to, to note that this notion of proportionality in the Hebrew scriptures with an eye for an eye was actually in the ancient Near East that brought in like proportionality because it used to be like if someone took an eye maybe I'll take your whole body or like and so that was actually a reigning in like revenge of just like okay you can only harm someone as much as they have harmed you um, and then things went further not to do that um, in other parts of scripture and, and in the New Testament edicts against revenge but um, people aren't even looking at that aspect of like proportionality like I am a pacifist I am for Christian nonviolence um, but if someone was a realist and they were saying like oh well what if Israel needed you know to do some type of violence clearly they wouldn't need to kill 40,000 people plus um, I don't know if that's, it's, it's, it's terrible. People are just ig ignoring parts of scripture and highlighting the parts that justify violence, um, justify revenge, and fail to focus on the fact that at the beginning of, of the Torah, at the beginning of the Christian Bible, is that all people are made in the image of God, worthy of dignity, respect of life and well-being, um, regardless of religious identity, regardless of racial ethnic identity. Um, and a lot of people don't view Palestinian lives as, as precious, but they are.